All right, well, welcome back from lunch. Um, good time to have a little nap. Um, and then hopefully halfway through you'll wake up and then we'll be doing something interesting by then. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do CMB probes of large scale structure. And so that's basically, um, you know, we talked about the surface of last scattering as being when the photons last met anything in the universe. Um, that's actually not true. Um, lots of the photons in the universe have actually had meaningful interactions uh, since the first 380,000 years. Um, and so the most meaningful ones would be Thompson scattering and the fact that they've just run into electrons. So the optical depth to um, reun it, well, the optical depth to Thompson scattering is something around 0.05 or 0.06, which automatically says something like five or 6% of the photons have experienced an electron since they last left the CMB. Um, and then lensing, so lensing affects everything, everything that propagates through the universe, so those geodesics get deflected, and that includes the light from the CMB. Um, I think I'm not going to talk about the extragalactic foreground, well, I'm going to kind of talk about the extragalactic foregrounds, but not the ones that are generating new photons, just the ones that are mucking around with the original ones. All right, so this was a picture, this is where we last left it, right, we had this last scattering surface in here, and then um, these photons were supposed to just come to us um, but then you look at this cartoon and what you see is all sorts of stuff along the line of sight. And so in particular, there's going to be some, um, some electrons that are associated with reionization. And then also as it's going past this large scale structure in the universe, you're going to get trouble. All right. So, you know, I had this plot. So just to review, so having given the talk yesterday, it's easy for me to grab the slides. So we had this thing and I said, oh, look, um, you know, the number of electrons drops precipitously and then decays, but then notice that's wh whatever redshift this was, just below 10, we suddenly got a lot more electrons. So what does that mean? Well, in particular, that means that if you look at the CMB power spectrum, so uh, there's the temperature, you can't really see too much going on here. And then you see there's all these bumps and wiggles. And you would look at this and you could quite reasonably say, oh, look at all these bumps and wiggles. But what you don't notice is actually this bump turns out to be a totally different bump than all the other ones. Um, these are coming from the acoustic oscillations at recombination. So um, whereas this one big one up here is actually coming from rescattered radiation from the, uh, after the universe was reionized. And so that's again, coming from this idea, you generate polarization when there's a quadrupole and when you have scattering off of electrons. So when the universe became reionized at a redshift of six or seven or eight or whatever we're gonna find out it's at, um, those electrons experienced a CMB quadrupole the same way we see a CMB quadrupole. So all that scattered light ends up getting polarized. And so this bump down here is the reionization bump. And you can use that to actually estimate exactly how much scattering went on. And notice that um, it's here in uh, the E modes, it's also down here in the B modes. And so um, there are ideas that maybe if you were to launch a satellite, something like Lightbird, you could actually try to measure these primordial gravitational waves by going after this reionization bump. Um, so in, in particular, here is um, the CMB temperature and polarization power spectra. So this is the E modes, these are the T modes. Um, if all you do is you just inject a screen of electrons at a redshift of 6.3 or 12, and the main thing that happens is you just knock a bunch of electrons out of the beam. So to zeroth order, sorry, you knock some photons out of the beam. There were these acoustic oscillations with this nice pattern. You end up mixing that up because it's gone through this sort of 5%, 6% scattering screen. And so you start with uh, something that's uh, up there, you can even see it on here, you get knocked down. Now, if you instead put in the requirement that uh, you're going to boost the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations by exactly the amount of this optical depth, which is to say, if you keep the combination of AS times E to the minus two tau constant, then you can see there's actually a black line and a blue line in here that are right on top of each other everywhere except way down here. And so you get a little bit of excess temperature that's just coming from, uh, well, basically kinetic SZ, it's just from Doppler shifts on the, the scale of the horizon. Um, and otherwise the spectrum, there's two lines in here, black and blue look just exactly identical. So that's a huge degeneracy in the CMB is AE to the minus tau, minus two tau. Um, 
In polarization, though, notice what's happened is, yeah, you knock a few things out of the beam, which is to say these look different. Um, but this black line you see is now way down here because if you reionize this at 6.3, your optical depth is only 0.04. If instead you reionize a redshift of 12, it's way up here. And you see, you get a boost by a factor of several in the powers, power in the E modes. And so this is how we measure tau um, using um, the CMB. And in fact, this is still one of our most, um, this is still a unique constraint on reionization. So most of what we know about reionization comes from some combination of reading the tea leaves on Lyman alpha absorption profiles and things like that and counting galaxies and guessing how many UV photons each galaxy produces. Um, whereas this is telling us directly how many electrons there are between us and the CMB. So this is an extremely powerful constraint on uh, reionization. So in principle, we could actually learn more about it by studying the details of the reionization bump, but it turns out it's that's going to be hard. Okay, so that's some of the photons that got scattered out of the beam or got scattered into the beam were just the, coming from the diffuse medium. So just taking no fluctuations in the universe at all and just saying it's scattering some fluctuating quadrupole. And that's what causes this reionization bump is just a homogeneous electron population that's scattering the anisotropic temperature field. Um, now, another thing that is scattering of the CMB, uh, there's a whole series of them that go by the name of the sunyaev zoldovich effects. So we'll start with this one. So often people start with the other one because it's bigger, but we'll start with this one because I think it's, um, you know, it's first order in velocity instead of second order in velocity. So we'll start go by going through the orders. So the kinetic sunyaev zoldovich effect says that if you have some cloud of electrons, um, and so, you know, you get these all over the place, anywhere you just have a concentration of electrons and then you have CMB photons coming in. If this cloud has some bulk velocity, and if you're down here looking at it, um, you're going to pick up some net redshift or blue shift, depending on whether that thing is coming towards you or away from you. Um, so it's basically just a moving mirror. If you have some mirror moving towards you with velocity V, you're going to get some, order V over C redshifting from all the light that gets scattered. Um, so if it's going towards you, you get a blue shift. If it's going away from you, you get a red shift. And so you get this, the order of magnitude of this, or the, the, it's the temperature shift. The fractional temperature shift, temperature shift depends on how much scattering happened. So it's just the number of electrons in this cloud, the number density times DL just says how much scattering happened. And then it's the projection. So this is supposed to be some N hat um, dotted into the peculiar velocity in units of V over C. So that's how big it is. And then you put in some numbers and you start thinking about how big this is going to be. Well, so a typical uh, line of sight optical depth for something like a, a group of galaxies or something like that, you might expect about 10 to the minus three of the photons that go through some little bit of a galaxy group or a galaxy, a small galaxy cluster would get Thomson scattered. And so you have 10 to the minus three, and then you're gonna multiply that by some typical velocity of, in the universe. So a typical velocity in the universe, things move at hundreds of kilometers a second. So that's another something like 10 to the minus three. So you're gonna end up at somewhere around 10 to the minus six. So in general, this kinetic SZ is gonna be something on the order of a few microkelvin. So that's small, um, but not tiny. Uh, so where do we get these electrons? So there's basically, you know, here's the cartoon of what happened in the universe. Well, so they're the dark ages where everything was neutral. Reionization happens. You got lots of electrons there. And you see that they're all clumpy in this cartoon. And then you have the clumpy universe down here. So here you're getting like order unity fluctuations in the electron fraction because you go from neutral regions to ionized regions to neutral regions to ionized regions. Down here, you have almost the entire universe is ionized which means you actually have very little contrast. So if you're only getting very small fluctuations from place to place, it's hard, you don't have much contrast. So it makes it a little harder to see perhaps. Um, but if you just say, how much is this gonna contribute to the cosmic microwave background? Uh, you draw one of these um, CMB power spectra. So there's the power spectrum. So that's um, unlensed and lensing fills in this high L tail. Um, what you get is you're actually going to get two contributions. So it typically gets broken into two bits. So there's the stuff that's coming from this large scale structure. You have galaxies and clusters all around us that are sloshing along the line of sight. So that gives you some small fluctuations. 
Um, and then on top of that, there's a contribution from reionization. And so the bit that's coming from large scale structure, we think we can calculate pretty well because we know roughly where, how much stuff there is and how fast it's moving. Um, however, the part that's coming from reionization um, is basically completely unknown at this point because we don't know how reionization happens. So measuring this uh, late time KSZ would tell us something about the early stages of reionization. And it's something that we're moving towards. We should have, I would guess maybe even in the next year, we'll have measurements of that. All right, um, so what's the status right now of KSZ? So, so I just wanna get you to frame things. So currently it's been detected at very, you know, reasonably high signal noise, tens, twenties, 20 sigma um, in cross correlation, which is to say, if we see where there are some clouds of electrons and we look at how they're moving compared to how fast they should be moving. Um, so maybe as a pairwise estimator, which is you take little, you take pairs and if this one's on the front and this one's on the back, they should be infalling, which means this one's coming this way and this one's coming this way. So that means if you're over there and you're looking at the um, KSZ, all the stuff on this side should be a little, all the electrons scattered off of this hand should be a little bit blue shi red shifted, and this hand should all be a little blue shifted. So you can just look for pairs and say, do we see that the backside one is generally falling towards the front side one? and vice versa. And so that's called the pairwise KSZ. You can write it as a bispectrum if you want, a galaxy, galaxy, temperature, bispectrum. So that's been detected by Planck, it's been detected by SPT, it's been detected by ACT. Um, but at the level of maybe 10, 20 sigma, which is not 1% precision, which is where we wanna go for precision cosmology. Um, so that's only gonna get better as the instruments get bigger, a more sensitive, more sky. Um, so the forecast is that, uh, well, even with SPT3G, we think we should be able to detect this basically right now, just on its own and not have to do the cross correlation. And what's nice about that is it lets us go to reionization and see what's coming from reionization and not be limited to the stuff coming from the galaxies we know about. Um, but looking forward, what's really exciting about this probe is that it's measuring the velocities, right? So we're measuring how fast things are moving. And the velocities are coherent over very large scales. So if you just think about, you have some density fluctuation here, you have some, um, uh, the velocity is, there's stuff gonna be infalling towards it. So in general, um, the velocities are more sensitive to large scales than small scales. And so if you go out and you measure the velocities and you then turn that into a limit on, the, on P of K, this is the matter power spectrum as a function of K, and so this blue line is just what you might expect from some biasing thing, uh, some prescription that Frank will probably say is hopelessly incorrect, but that's okay. Um, and so what you see here is just the uh, shot noise that you would expect from some very deep galaxy survey. And so what that's saying is that you're, you know, you're measuring the number density of galaxies. And so the number count distribution is gonna be limited by square root of the n fluctuations per just from spot to spot. And so that in these units just looks like a straight line. So this is the shot noise just from, uh, you can only measure things to a reasonable accuracy just because uh, it's limited by the number of galaxies in your survey. This red line is what you could get if you did a very deep KSE measurement, which is to say, if all you did was you just measured very carefully this, these fluctuations and turn that into constraints on velocities on large scales, you could actually get a very high signal noise measurement of the matter fluctuations on scales that are way over here. So when Frank showed that the P of K, P of K went up and then matter radiation quality was around here and then it rolled over. Well, we're way up here on scales before, you know, on to the left of the peak of that matter power spectrum where you just don't see measurements being done in galaxy surveys because that's the scale of the, the of entire surveys, it's really hard to measure. And so what this means is you can access these very large scales. So uh, I don't think anyone's talked about this, and maybe no one will. Um, one of the reasons you wanna measure these large scales is that FNL that Joel was talking about actually shows up in the galaxy distribution as some scale dependent bias. So this is the matter power spectrum assuming some constant bias. You get this uptick at low K that's coming from non-Gaussianity in the, in the density field. So. Um, so that's something that would be exciting to do, but it's going to take measurements that are probably um, when you're getting your faculty jobs, those measurements will just start to be getting made. 
All right, so that's just from things moving one way or the other way along the line of sight. And so that was the kinetic Sinyaev Zoldovich effect. There's another effect that's called the thermal Sinyaev Zoldovich effect. And that just comes, that's just the next order effect. It's like, well, um, so if it's moving this way, it's a red shift. If it's moving this way, it's a blue shift. Well, what if I have two things moving this way? Well, to first order, they cancel. To second order, there's going to be some net distortion because they're not going to cancel exactly perfectly when you, um, you know, do the expansions. Um, so that's the thermal Sinyaev Zoldovich effect. And your first response would be, well, why isn't that like V squared over C squared? If the other one's V over C, this one's V squared over C squared. And you're right. It's just the question is, what is the relevant velocity? And so for the thermal Sinyaev Zoldovich effect, again, and what you care about are the electron velocities. And so what are the characteristic electron velocities in the universe? So uh, when I said characteristic velocities of large scale structure are hundreds of kilometers a second, that says you have some bulk flow that's sliding along here, just like we're moving at a few hundred kilometers a second relative to the CMB. Um, but in a, in, within some halo, what you've got going on is you've got things whizzing back and forth. And in particular, what's generally going to be carrying all the momentum is going to be the protons. And the protons are a lot more massive than the electrons. So for one, so the typical velocities there of a few hundred kilometers a second are for protons. Now, if they're in thermal equilibrium with the electrons, then that means you have your MV squared is comparable to KT. Uh, well, if they're in thermal equilibrium, they have the same T, which means their velocities are gonna have an offset um, just because the electrons are a thousand times, or well, roughly a thousand times less massive. Um, so the electron velocities turn out to actually be quite, quite quick. Um, and then on top of that, if instead of looking at just bulk flows from large scale structure, if you instead go to galaxy clusters where the thermal velocities of the protons can be um, over a thousand kilometers a second, you're now starting to get to an interestingly high level of velocities for the electrons such that um, even though it's V squared over C, it's V over C all squared, that number turns out to be actually bigger than just the V over C from the bulk flows. Um, so that's characterized by this number. So it's KT over MC squared. And that's just saying that's the thing that's gonna come out as V squared. So that's because second order in, in V. And then again, it's gonna be however many scatterings happen. And so this is where it comes out to be KT over MC squared times this optical depth. So again, you do these optical depths of um, 10 to the minus three, or maybe even if approaching 10 to the minus two. And then you, if you look in galaxy clusters, a galaxy cluster can be uh, maybe five or 10 keV compared to the 511 keV. And so this number can become something like 1%. So you can actually end up being um, 10 or 20 times larger than the kinetic effect in a massive galaxy cluster. Now, what's interesting about this is you put these together, you get N, K, T. Um, well, that's the thermal pressure. And so what's interesting about this is that you have some um, thing that you can measure, which is how much of this Thompson scattering happened and got um, this distortion. And it's going to be telling you something about the integral of the thermal pressure along the line of sight, sight through your cluster. Um, so that's an interesting thing, just because it seems like physics is in there, right? So pressure is something that you can, you've seen in undergraduate physics. Um, and so in principle, this seems like something we might have a much better chance of being able to extract from simulations. Um, and the only thing that's a bit of a drag on this is that it's only the thermal pressure. So you have to worry about turbulent motions or if you have some cosmic ray support or things like that. So there are things that can cause problems, but the problems are like 10% problems, not 50% problems. And so what people think is that um, this should actually be a reasonably reliable estimate of just the energy content of galaxy clusters. Um, all right, so how do we measure it? Well, so the way you measure it is you, so you start with this background uh, CMB, it goes through these, this hot electron bath, and then on average, you get some scattering. And so what generally happens, so remember Thompson scattering conserves number density, right? You conserves number, you get one in, one out, you don't create new photons. And so you start with this nice black body CMB. And on average, what you're gonna do is you're gonna give a little bit of energy to every photon that gets scattered. And so you take this nice black body and you just shift everything up in energy. And you see that at low frequencies, you actually get a decrement, which is to say you lose photons at low energy, you gain photons out here at high energy, 
Um, and so it has this characteristic spectral signature and it's not the same as the one for the um, KSE. So the KSE was just saying you take everything and you just make it look like it has a slightly higher temperature. Um, but because that's just Lorentz boosting and things like that, everything ends up getting conserved. If you start with a black body spectrum, you end up with a black body spectrum, just a new black body. Um, whereas here, you're actually starting with a black body, conserving number density, but giving everything a little more energy, which is to say it's a non-thermal, it's called the thermal sinyavs oldovich effect, but it's, its signature is that it takes the thermal CMB and uh, distorts its thermal character. Um, all right. So this is what I mean. It just has some decrement down here. This is the intensity difference as a function of frequency. You see there's a hole in the sky at frequencies below about 217 gigahertz. And there's an excess on, at frequencies above that. Um, and then there's a slight dependence on exactly what, what temperature of the gas you're looking at, um, just from the relativistic boosts and going back and forth. Um, so, but that's what, how you would find this, is you would just look for basically a hole, a hole in the CMB Um, but this is what the microwave sky actually looks like in 150 gigahertz. Um, so a natural response is, uh, holy crap, what the this? Um, well, so these things here are almost all going to be um, basically AGM, so they're supermassive black holes that are actively accreting. Um, so that's what most of these are. A couple of them are strongly lensed dust galaxies. Um, so those are good for finding dark matter or looking for dark matter. Um, so this is probably a point source. This is probably an AGN sitting in the center of a nearby galaxy cluster. But what we see a lot of them when we characterize the SBT are little dots like this. You can barely even see it. So let's see they can't see what's going on. It's just right there. There's a little tiny dimple in the CMB. And so we found a whole bunch of these all over the place. And so here's another one. There's another dimple up here. This is from the previous generation of SBT. This is SBTSC. So this is just a little hole in the sky. You zoom in, you're like, oh, that's weird. It's a little hole in the sky. It's just like a, one of those ADN, except it's got the wrong sign. And then you take an optical image of this part of the sky. And what you see is you see a, a big cluster of galaxies right in the bullseye here. We're using the contours of the flux for SBT. And you see that we found a giant galaxy cluster. So this is the way you can go find a bunch of galaxy clusters. And this was one that we that had not been characterized. People did not know this thing was there. And yet it's one of the heaviest objects in the universe. Probably only about 10 objects in the universe that we think are heavier than this. So and we found it just by this little tiny dimple in the sky. Um, so this is one way we could use the CMD to probe large scale structure. So you know, Frank was talking about. Um, you know, looking at the number counts of the function of mass and using that as maybe telling you something about cosmology. Well, um, this is a way to find things at the very high mass end of that. Um, so, lots of people have done. This a whole lot of galaxy clusters that have been discovered. So for studies of large scale structure, if you need a galaxy cluster catalog, um, this is a good way to go. And then the other thing to notice is you see the lower line here um, actually looks pretty sharp in mass, which is to say there's some scatter across here, but not a huge amount. Um, and part of that is just because, remember I said it's, the SZ is only sensitive to the line of sight pressure. Well, that line of sight pressure is very is a pretty good proxy for just the total mass, right? The, how much pressure there is in some region is going to depend on what those virial velocities are. 
and that's um, going to be related to the mass. So um, it gets you something that's nearly mass selected, and you can see it's almost independent of redshift because it's just a spectral distortion of the CMB. You put this distortion in at high redshift, and it redshifts along with the CMB. Um, so it's nearly independent of redshift and mainly only depends on mass. And the reason we're running out of clusters out here is just because there are not very many clusters at high redshift, which is to say structure has formed hierarchically. There are just were not very many 10 to the 15 solar mass objects that were in existence at a redshift of two. So um, by doing things like this, you can sort of track the evolution. So what else can you do with this? Well, um, so remember I said it depends on the frequency. Right sources. Um, and so what you see are some things by eye right here, which are just going to jump out. So this, if I had to guess. I'm only going to guess, but that's almost certainly just coma, the coma cluster or something like that. So there's some nearby things. Um, but in general, this is a map of all the spots where there's a hole in the sky if you look at 150 gigahertz. Um, so what could you do with this? Well, one thing you might do with it is take the power spectrum. So we're cosmologists. We just take the power spectrum of everything, right? That's what we do. Um, so here's the power spectrum, L, L plus one CL over two pi. And so this is from Planck, are these data points? And that's not exactly from where it came from, but it's roughly where it came from is basically taking the power spectrum of this map. Um, and so what do you see? Well, you see there's a bunch of points and they rise. And what we're seeing here is basically just the one halo term. We're just seeing the most, everything from about here up is entirely just coming from the one halo term, which is to say you're just looking at the gas inside a single object, not the correlations between clusters. Um, and then what you see out here um, are measurements from ACT and SPT. And what I want you to get out of this is that you can use the Planck measurements and kind of guess at what the spectrum should look like. And what's happening is it seems like it doesn't quite turn over fast enough to go through the, um, the SPT and ACT points. And what that's saying is that um, the models that we have for galaxy clusters are predicting a little bit too much small scale power um, in a given galaxy cluster compared to what we're seeing. So galaxy clusters seem like they're probably a little bit puffier than whatever the current state of the art simulations are predicting. So that's um, something, if you can solve that, that's, uh, then uh, that would be really nice because there's clearly something going on here. We're not quite sure what it is. And it's a problem that's been that's persisted now for probably ever since these points were still were first produced. And the first generation of these points was probably from 2010 or something. So for 13 years, no one has managed to come up with a reasonable model that can actually suppress the power on the scale of a few arc minutes um, in the SD sky. So that's something to keep your eyes peeled for. All right. All right, so what was the other one? Well, so the other thing that's kind of unavoidable is just the gravity from large scale structure. So um, we thought we had the CMB map, the photons come propagating through the universe. As they come propagating the, through the universe, they pass this large scale structure and they'll get deflected back and forth. Um, and so this is gravitational lensing. Um, so what we have here is I think the first time possibly in this conference. Well, no, Frank must have done it. Um, but we're at second order. So I think people, forget, because CMB lensing just seems like a standard part of cosmology, people tend to think of it as being just like all the other fluctuations. But this is a second order effect. This is deflection of the primary fluctuations by the fluctuations in the universe in between. So when I talked about the reionization bump, that reionization bump was from the smooth universe scattering the anisotropic primary fluctuations. So that was still first order. This is a second order effect. And um, so where we are in cosmology right now is we're now starting to measure a lot of these second order effects at extremely high signal noise. So this is the primary fluctuations getting lensed by stuff in between. 
And I think if you haven't thought about this before, you could very reasonably think, well, if I start with a Gaussian random field and then I deflect it, who cares? Like the CMB, remember, like uh, Joel was telling us, we're searching for the non Gaussianity of the cosmic microwave background, which is another way of saying it's as Gaussian as we can measure it to be. So if it's Gaussian, you just have some random field, which is like as random as it could be, how could it possibly matter that you are kicking stuff around? So um, I'll save that for after the break. First of all, let's just do a little review here of what's going on in gravitational lensing. Um, just to set some terms. So I know, uh, I think what tomorrow, I think, or the day after we're gonna get more gravitational lensing. So since I'm doing it now, I'll uh, set the terms here. So what happens? Well, you have light coming by, it gets bent by intervening structure and there's some bending angle. So the reduced, uh, so the bending angle is you just have four GM over whatever this impact parameter is. So if we assume it's a thin lens, then you have light coming in this way it was gonna go over here and miss the observer down in that corner. So we were gonna miss the observer over there. Instead, it got um, deflected in and it came in. And so the, the uh, if you do the Newtonian version, you get two and four GM is the famous factor of two from general relativity. Um, so that's the bending angle. And that's just saying, well, uh, how much did it get deflected? And so if you look at the geometry here, you see we have this thing right here we call beta. So I'm just setting my terms here because I'm about to actually um, write down the lens equation. So beta is where this thing came from initially. So if this lens wasn't here, where would you have seen this object? That's beta. Instead, light took the path where it came this way and then got bent down towards you that's gonna be theta, and that says, where did you see it? So theta is where you saw it, beta is where you would have seen it in the absence of the lens, and then the difference between those two, so alpha is up here, that's saying how much did it get bent. This alpha up here is how much it got bent, and that's that 4GM, so now you have all the geometry you need to figure out what's going on. So the things that are gonna matter here, so you start, you know, it's the, I remember I said in the last lecture, that we turn everything into a spring. Well, so yes, we turn everything into a spring. The other thing that I think we do ad nauseum in a physics education is build triangles. Um, so, you know, every, the first thing we did were blocks sliding down ramps and it was basically education in triangles. Um, so what's our triangle? Well, the triangles are gonna involve these angles, but notice the distances that matter are the distance to the deflector, which is the lens, the distance to the source and this distance in between. Those are the, those are the numbers that are gonna come up into this. So the, there's a classic review by Bartleman and Schneider. And I don't think anyone has come up with a better one that it's basically the standard reference for um, a lot of lensing stuff. All right, so we're gonna use our triangles and we're just gonna rewrite this position right here in terms of all of these other things that we've talked about which is to say the where it is, just as a vector, if we're just gonna draw these things as vectors in the source plane, is gonna be um, where you see it minus this vector right here, right? So this vector that you see right here is gonna be the vector to the source plane and the vector there. And so this is the deflection that's happening at this mid-plane distance. Right, so this is happening at this mid-plane distance right here. That was what came into the bending angle was the impact parameter. The impact parameter is in the lens plane. So you write this down, you get that beta is just some theta minus some deflection angle. So this is the lens equation. So this is all of gravitational lensing is actually right here on this slide. It's super simple. It's just where it actually is, is where you see it moved back by some alpha that just depends on how far um, your impact parameter was from the center of your lens. And um, so what's a little unfortunate about this is that you see that alpha is a function of where it went. And this actually makes it a little bit nonlinear if you're trying to invert it, um, because what you would like is you would like to, you'd like it to be just something that depends on where it was and not have the deflection 
be super sensitive to what happened in the lens plane. So it can make, get, make it a little nonlinear when you're trying to measure it. Um, but okay, but this is the lens equation. Beta is theta minus alpha. And then you can just write down this alpha in terms of how much mass is in this plane, right? So this just depends on how, so for a point mass, it just depends on the total mass and how far away you are. Well, if I put a swarm of point masses in here, then each one of them is gonna add together. So I'm gonna write this as the mass density. So this is the projected mass density. And then there's a one over R that's coming from, you know, this is one over R. This is basically one over R and then we're doing it as vectors. So these things all add up properly. So that's the deflection. You're just saying, what's the mass density? And then um, doing one over R and then you're integrating over the entire lens plane. Um, now, one thing that you could also do is you could actually write this alpha as the gradient of some lensing potential. In the same way that if you wanted to write um, a 3D potential in terms of the, um, you know, if you just wanted to do Poisson's equation, so the projected version of Poisson's equation, so Poisson's equation in 2D is that there's a lensing potential which just looks like this. And then alpha is going to be related to the gradient of that potential. So the, these, are the, these are the terms of gravitational lensing. All right, now, one last thing. So this is a deflection, which, and so what is that saying? Well, that says that you see some object over there and it came from somewhere else. The problem is, is that you don't actually know where it came from on its own. So it's very hard to measure deflection on its own because you don't have a grid that says, I came from four centimeters over from the line um, past Polaris. Instead, you can only look at relative distances. And so the only thing that's readily, readily accessible or readily accessible are gradients of that deflection. And you'll see in a sec, well, you'll see after the break how that's gonna work. Um, but if you just go back to this equation and you say, well, it's beta is theta minus alpha. And then let's just look at how that changes as I, how does the source position change as I vary theta, which is to say, um, I see something coming from there and it mapped into some beta. So I saw it coming from over there. It intrinsically came from some spot there. Well, if I saw some other thing just to the right of it, where did it come from in the source plane? So we're just doing this sort of Jacobian to say, how does, how does the bundle of light that we saw from some direction map into the bundle of light as it was emitted? And so you write down what that is, and that's just a matrix, right? This is a vector, right? It's a, your beta and theta are 2D vectors on the sphere. Um, and so there's the XY, there's the X mixing, there's the Y, and then there's the XY. And so you can break this into four bits. So there's the, the shear along say the X direction. So one minus kappa minus gamma, one minus kappa plus gamma. And then you have these cross terms, which are gamma. And these things are defined as gradients of that potential. So these are just the definitions. And these are the things that we call, so kappa is what we call the convergence and gamma is what we call the shear. And what that's saying is that um, if some lensing happens, so if you go through some region that's just over dense, it's going to um, expand some part of the sky. So convergence really is taking some bit of the sky and making it bigger. And what the shear is doing is it's taking some piece of the sky and it's stretching it in one direction and compressing it in the other. Um, so just like the polarization, this is a spin two field. So, um, you're taking it and you stretch it top and bottom and you compress it in this way. That's one component of the shear. That's the one you see right here. And then the other thing is you can stretch it along one line and compress it along the other or stretch it at 45 degrees and compress it at the other 45 degrees. That's gamma two. So there's two components. And so here I'm doing it relative to some X, Y grid. That If I put beta X, beta Y, beta X, theta Y, and you see it's just like the Stokes parameter, it's gonna depend on how we've defined our grid. So these are just the words. Um, and so then we'll hear a lot more about this stuff when we do, when we do weak lensing for galaxies. Um, all right, so let's take a break. Well, let's first get some questions if we have it. <laughs> 
And then I think we're on schedule for a break right now, seems about right. And then I'm gonna specifically talk about CMB lenses. So do we have any questions right now? Yep. Uh, can I ask a question? So uh, the camera one and camera two defined here, is one of them defined as tenuous or, or is it uh -huh. defined to be like a linear combination? Um, so this is, so the gamma one and gamma two are defined basically on a Cartesian grid. So you basically pick some axes and it's a Cartesian grid. And uh, where you get the tangential shear versus the other shear is exactly like the E modes and B modes, which is um, that uh, in general, what's going to happen is if you have a, so let's just think about what say beta, so this is the derivative of beta with respect to theta, and let's look at this off diagonal. So this would be like an xy term. So that's saying, how does the shear change in the x direction as a function of y? And so what that's telling us here, you say, well, so I have some mass and it's deflected the photons, that's basically expanded the sky in that spot. And so there's the deflection that's happening right there. And so what that's saying, is how does that little light bump bundle that would have started as being round, what happens to it um, as it goes past that mass? And what's gonna happen is depending on exactly what the mass profile is of that mass, it's going to get compressed in one direction and stretched in the other. Um, and so that's if you go straight out along X, and then if you do the same thing for the other component of the shear, that one's gonna be zero at that point. Um, and so the tangential versus, versus radial is just telling you about how your Cartesian grid is mapping into which way the symmetries of the deflection are. And so the symmetries of the deflection in gravitational lensing, if you have a round mass, all the deflection is in the radial direction. So that radial direction is always gonna be preferred. And so if you do some tilt, if you change to that axis for whatever spot you're looking at, you're always gonna see that the shear is along the direction that's perpendicular to the radius vector. Um, so that's something that's in particular because it's coming um, from gravitational lensing, that it's not true for any deflection you would write down. You could imagine deflecting things however you want, and then you could get these shear fields that would not respect this equivalent of the EB symmetry. Yep. Uh, so yeah, sorry, can you just reiterate in the KSC bit? Um, so how, how does a dark spot in the sky correspond to uh, a heavy cluster? Um, so the dark spot in the sky, so where it's coming from is this thermal SZ effect is coming from, it really is. So this red line right here, I know this is drawn as a cartoon, but we could do it as an, you know, I think I'm, I wrote a review article where we did it properly. Um, so you start with this, so let's say this is the black body of the CMB. And now what we're gonna do is you're gonna have it Compton scatter with a hot electron. So we have a three Kelvin CMB scattering with 10 to the seven Kelvin cluster gas, and it's gonna gain energy, right? Every scatter is gonna gain a little bit of energy, but it doesn't change the number. And so remember the intensity is um, the number of photons times the energy of each photon for frequency interval. And if you increase the energy of each photon, then that's generally going to kick that thing slightly up and to the right in this distribution of intensity versus frequency, which is to say this photon gets moved up in energy, gets moved to the right, and it also goes up a little bit because this is per frequency. And so every photon gets ever so slightly shifted, but then once you're over here, um, you see that you're actually getting an excess of photons at high energy and you're losing the low energy tail. And it all has to do with the slope of that curve. And so when the slope is going as, when you're in the Rayleigh genes, you lose photons. When you're on the Wien side, you gain photons. And there's a crossover right here, right around 220 gigahertz. Um, so if you look down here at 150, and so this crossover is at 220. If you look at 150, it's just gonna be a little hole in the sky. Thanks. All right. So if there are no more questions, yep. Um, so in the beginning, you were talking about uh, reionization. Uh, re and uh, so my question is, why is uh, the reionization bump only at large scales and uh, not 
Or yeah, so that's a very good question. So why is the reionization bump um, on these scales? Well, it's because the physics of it is it's coming from the quadrupole. Um, so in general, what's happening is what you're seeing is the scale of the quadrupole at the time that the scattering happens. So in fact, the slide that I skipped over would show it better that um, there's a bump. So this is if you just take a pulse, if I have a shell of electrons, it's delta Z of one wide. And I say, what is the reionization bump that that thing would generate? If I put that at a redshift of 13, that bump comes out to be at L of, I don't know what that is, seven or eight. And that's because the horizon size, which is the scale the quadrupole is coherent over. So you know we, we see almost the same quadrupole as someone a quarter of the way across the universe from the CMB, just because it's a lot of the same correlated modes. And so there's kind of, so there's a scale, which is roughly the, the horizon size at reionization. And um, that's the scale over which the quadrupole is almost the same, which is to say that's the scale over which you're going to get a bump. And so since the scale, the horizon size at redshift of 13 corresponds to some piece of the universe that's maybe that big. And then at redshift of six, it corresponds to some universe that's that big. So as that scattering happens at lower and lower redshift, it fills in these lower and lower L's until stuff at redshift of um, you know, two or one is basically just filling in the same L of two that, we're, that we would be seeing. Yep. Um, are you showing the uh, right uh, points and said that uh, here we can see AGN. Uh, is it AGN in early universe? or some? Um, I think, well, we a lot of them we don't know. We actually don't have redshifts for a lot of AGN. Mm -hmm. um, so we think that, so they're almost certainly all coming. A lot, bunch of them are probably a redshift of one or two. Um, but it's this, it's the, so the reason that you never hear anyone say anything about these in a, so we just call them point sources. And it's, these are the same AGN that people see in radio. So that there are, you know, if, um, you know, the VLA has catalogs of these things. There are already large catalogs of these. And most of the ones that you, most of the dots that you see here are sources that have known counterparts in the radio. And um, they don't all have redshifts, but they're probably at some, most of them are probably redshift of one or two. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for two questions from Zoom? Yeah, so uh, first question, can we make some method to measure distance from the constancy of luminosity and lensing? What is that question? <laughs> can I read it? Hey, go ahead. No, it's right there. Can we make some method to measure distance from the constancy of luminosity and lensing? Um, right, so, um, so lensing can serve surface brightness. Um, so it's definitely true that uh, there are lots of ways to try to get ratios of distances by measuring how much lensing has happened as you, for if you take either the same lens and you look at how it lenses things in the distance, as you change the source distance, it changes the amount of lensing. As you change the, um, the lens distance for a fixed source, that also changes the amount of lensing just because all those triangles from first year physics, that those same triangles are in effect. So, um, so you can definitely use those as a cosmological indicator. And so people, so that's actually a fairly independent constraint on curvature that you can get just from CMB lensing. Um, I don't know if there's anything you can do about Louisville's theorem. So basically surface brightness can serve just because Louisville's theorem is true. And I don't think that gets you anything new. And I'll have to think about that one. Let's take, let's take a break maybe. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's uh, send that break. Okay, let's take a break. All right, so we're back. So we were last seen lensing the CMB, right? Um, 
And as I said, it's a little weird. We're lensing this random field with some other random field. How could that matter? I'm gonna show you how that matters. Um, so, you know, just to remind everyone where we are, CMB lensing, we start with the CMB at some location. There's an unlensed CMB, which comes from some spot in, on, the, on a sphere at redshift 1100. And we see it after it propagates through the universe coming at some other angle. We think that it looks like it just came unimpeded from over there. We don't know that it actually had this long journey. Um, and so you can write that as being, we see it at some location. We see a lens CMB and that's gonna be whatever the unlensed CMB was at some other location. And this is in units of temperature. So uh, the CMB can serve surface brightness. So temperature is a surface brightness. So the lensing doesn't change the apparent temperature. It's just changing what location we're gonna assign to each one of those temperatures. So as long as we're in weak lens, the weak lensing limit, we can just add up all the deflections along the line of sight and not have to worry about the lensing of the lensing and just assume that they're all just active, you know, each one's kicking it left and right. And then we can say that this deflection, this grad phi, so we're writing a deflection field as the gradient of some uh, potential is just going to be the integrated sum of all of the 3D potentials, the gradients of those added up along each point, and then that's our deflection. Um, so now the CMB is kind of fun, well, it's very useful to do for this because uh, while we don't know what the unlensed CMB, we don't know what every pixel was, as far as we know, that initial CMB is to a high approximation, just a Gaussian random field, which means we know its correlation structure really well. Um, we also know exactly what redshift it's at. We don't have to do a photometric redshift for the CMB, different parts of the CMB. We know it's all coming from the same spot. So we don't have to guess about that. Um, and it's also behind everything, which is to say we can actually get the lensing from everything in between. So. Um, so Gary Bernstein's going to talk about uh, weak lensing and cosmic shear, where you can do this at lower redshifts. And um, in that sense, um, that's really convenient because the redshift is not unique, which is to say you actually get lensing coming from a bunch of different uh, line of sight positions, which means you can actually map out the line of sight stuff. Whereas here, we just get one sort of pancaked view of the entire universe. So we... Well, it's true that all the mass in the universe is contributing to the lensing, it's all just pancaked into one screen. So that's either an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on um, who you're asking for funding. All right. So, but let's just get a sense of um, how it is that we can reconstruct gravitational lensing of the CMB. So I, I, you go into the Planck map and you say, I wanna see the North Pole. So there's the North Pole right in the center of this map. And then uh, that was just to pick a spot in the sky. And now what I did is I'm, I stuck in a simulated lens that's a little bigger than the average. It's well, like 20 times or something bigger than what a real fluctuation would be. But just so you can get a sense of how a lens a, a, a would affect this and why it's not crazy to be using a nearly Gaussian random field to do a reconstruction of the lensing. So here we go. I've put a lens somewhere in this map. There it is. Um, so I hope you can all see that something has changed, right? But what's changed? You gotta kind of scratch your head and say like, okay, well, I can see that that's clearly different, but in what way is it different? It's still plus or minus. It's not like a mean, I haven't added a mean, um, but what we've done is that we took the central bit and it's wildly expanded, right? Which is to say the scale of the fluctuations in the middle of this lens are just way too big. So that's what your eye is seeing. It's like that spot doesn't look right because the fluctuations look to be too large in angle. And then you see some weird stuff on the outskirts and what you're seeing there is like, okay, well, the angles don't seem brutally wrong, but everything's like tangentially elongated which is to say um, the spectrum, the fluctuations now have some orientation to them. They've been sheared out in the angular, in the radial direction. So what you're seeing is you're seeing the convergence in the middle, which is to say the sky has just been magnified there. 
And then what you're seeing around the outsides is this tangential shear that's coming from the gradient in the potentials. And then the way I constructed this was so that it would be compensated because I didn't, wasn't quite sure how I was gonna deal with stuff going outside um, the edge of my box when I did this. Um, but, so now you have a, but let's say that I then said, okay, well, what if I put a lens somewhere else? How would you go find a lens? Well, the way you would go find the lens is you would go find spots where the power spectrum is messed up. You would look for spots for a convergence where the power spectrum is shifted to either large scales for positive convergence or small scales to negative convergence, where the hot spots have a characteristic size that's either too large or too small is a diagnostic for convergence. And then for shear is you can just look for spots where that two point correlation function has some orientation to it. So the two point correlation function is stretched or you could think of it as the power spectrum has some um, anisotropy to it. It's no longer only a function of scale, it has scale and orientation to it. And so what you're, you've just done by eye is you've come up with the idea of a quadratic estimator. And it's quadratic because you're looking at the square of the map. You're looking for spots where the two point correlation function is wrong, which means you're doing two points in your map or you're doing a power spectrum, which is basically a way of doing a square of your map. And so this is the easiest way to do these reconstructions is to just um, come up with some tuned um, product that actually just is effectively just looking for spots where the power spectrum is all messed up. All right. So, um, so here's just another version of this. If you wanna say like, what is lensing basically doing? Convergence is stretching the sky. Shear is changing the direction. If I take some, um, some mode and I shear it, effectively what I'm doing is I'm changing its direction a little bit. So that's convergence and shear. So what does that mean? Well, basically it means that effectively you take some CMB power spectrum and if that spot in the sky has been squeezed, what the convergence is going to do is it's going to take some power spectrum that used to look like this and it's going to shift it out to higher L, right? You squeeze the sky, you've moved stuff out to higher L, which is to say there was a mode that was here and it's now out there. So you've actually moved power around in your map by this lensing. The power was supposed to be at L of 1500, gets moved out to L of 2000 in that spot of the sky that's been stretched. So put another way, and then if you, um, if you amplify the sky, you move everything to lower L. And what's interesting is that this is literally the direction of the shift. It actually, in L squared CL, it moves power left and right. It doesn't move it up and down, it moves it exactly left and right, depending on whether it's convergent, whether it's a over density or an under density, is whether it moves left or right. All right, so now you're taking different parts of the sky and you're jittering the power either left or right. So what's that gonna do? Well, as Joel showed yesterday with the two-point correlation function, in the power spectrum, what it does is it smooths the peaks out because some spots of the sky are regions that have been magnified, some bits have been demagnified. And that says you start with some nice sharp acoustic peaks and then you jitter power around so that some of it goes left, some of it goes right. You fill in the troughs, you smooth out the, the, the peaks and it's ever so slightly smooths the peaks. So it has this effect of peak smoothing. And again, this has been magnified nine times larger than you'd expect, but it has been measured at high signal noise in, in CMB data. So you can measure the smoothing of the peaks. And that's just coming from the fact that when you average over the whole sky, some have been magnified, some have been demagnified. Um, so you can measure it that way, but that's not the most precise way to figure out what's going on. Um, a more precise way to see what's going on is to actually just do a Taylor expansion here say, okay, we started with the lens field at some location. Let's just Taylor expand this. Well, um, that's T plus grad T dotted with the deflection. And so, um, so one way to think about this is if I just like multiply this by grad T and then take the ensemble average, I have a grad T, grad T term, which is to say um, a Gaussian random field squared and a Gaussian random field squared has an average of not zero. And then we're gonna have a prefactor that's just acting on the deflection. Um, in Fourier space, you see that I have some gradient and it's multiplying some uh, deflection. That's a gradient of a potential. 
Well, if it's a if I'm multiplying in position space in Fourier space, that's a convolution. And so what that says is that I'm mixing together my modes. So remember I talked about at every location in the sky, you're mixing together these modes. And what that says is I, I take my original CMB map and I take some power from some particular um, mode and I'm just gonna move it around from some lensing action that corresponds to some particular scale. And that's in this plot here, what we were saying is there's some characteristic amount of shifting which is saying the co exactly how much convergence I've done at some location, which is to say, what's the coherent scale of that sh um, shifting? So if I construct a two-point correlation function in Fourier space, so this is in the flat sky, so I take two Fourier modes and I just say, what's the correlation of this mode and this mode? Well, in a Gaussian random field, that's supposed to be zero, but because of this action of this deflection, there's now the, the average mixing between this mode and this mode ends up being just proportional to the gravitational potential that corresponds to whatever their separation is. And so if I then take all my pairs of modes that are separated by exactly this amount, right? So there's a mode that's separated by exactly this red arrow, but I can take any other pairs of these CMB L1s and L2s, and as long as they're separated by exactly this distance in Fourier space, they're going to have exactly the same amount of mixing between them. That's going to be just depending on exactly how much power is in these was in the original mode and then just proportional to phi. So if I just take an average over all of these, I end up getting something that ends up being proportional to actually the amount of lensing that happened on exactly that separation. And this is a vector, which is to say, I can make a map of the lensing potential just by taking pairs, all the pairs in my CMB that are separated by a certain amount, give me phi that corresponds to exactly this wave number. I do that for all the different wave numbers I could imagine and I can build up a map. And so this is what a quadratic estimator is. Yep. Um, so what's happened with the unlensed uh, correlator? So the unlensed, so yeah, what happened with T times grad T? No, no, so, just TU, TU. Oh, well, you don't have TU, right? But so, but the two. yeah, so what I'm saying is that um, the thing that you can measure is TL. So you have some TL and some other TL. You can't measure the unlensed TU, right? So that's not, an, that's not something you can measure. So the okay, only thing- so the, Yeah, okay, so the CL1 just refers to like TL. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so what we're working with here is we're working in an approximation where there's a, only a small amount of power that's been mixed. So the assumption is that um, if you just measure the amount of, so this CL is basically the unlensed CL, but to at the level that we care about, or the level, at least for now, um, that the lens power and the unlensed power are close enough that that's not an amount we need to worry about. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, a this is a quadratic estimator. And then the only question is, how do you choose which pairs to use and how do you weight them? And so you can do optimal weighting. So uh, Wayne Hu did this for temperature and then Hu and Okamoto did it with polarization, also generalized it for full sky instead of all in the flat sky. But it's just fundamentally this idea that you're just going to make a map of how much lensing has happened by looking for how much. And um, so, and then we saw that those maps were super boxy, which is to say, we saw that the Q had this weird structure to it and that it was only coming from E modes. Well, so the, the lensing is not going to respect that symmetry. So here's some lensing. So I found out this web page is actually dead, but it's okay to come in and get it. Um, so what's going on here? This is an E-mode. This is one version of an E-mode. These are polarization vectors, polarized endless vectors. This is a B-mode. You can see there's some, um, it's changing as we go from left to right. 
but the polarization direction is at 45 degrees. Here, the changes are all happening either aligned or perpendicular to polarization uh, spectrums. And now we lens that. And again, I'm going to tell you there's some spot where the lens is going to go down. And I think it's pretty clear where that lens is going to go down. It's going to put it down, down here. And what you can see is that there's now some new direction that the spatial pattern is changing. The spatial pattern of the field is now changing in this radial direction, even though um, the you know the vectors, the headless vectors have whatever symmetry these e ones have. So what's happened is we basically have some patch of the field that has just grossly disrespected the hemode symmetry due to the lensing, which is to say we generated hemodes. But this spot is now a fairly, um, well, in this case, it's a random mix of B and B all in the spot, which means that initially we had B modes equal to zero, now we have B modes one. Um, so if your goal was to measure inflation, this would be awful. Joel would hate this. If your goal is to actually figure out where all the lenses are, this is fantastic, right? Because you now have a zero background channel to look for spots where lensing is happening. You just have to go find all your B-modes, and if those are all coming from lensing, you can now just find all the spots where your B-modes are, and that tells you where the lensing is. And so if you have a deep enough map, this is the best way to do CMB lensing. And so um, we're only now getting to the point where that is the channel that we can use. So Planck is basically almost entirely, uh, well, certainly best at doing it in temperature. Um, but SPT, I think we're now for the first time in this term, just slightly better at doing it in polarization than we are in temperature. All right. So there are maps of this that exist all over the place. So here there are, um, so there are a few other experiments that have done this. So here's one that came out last month, Max. So here's a Planck map. I don't know if this is the most recent one. I think it's one generation back. Here's uh, SPT 3G. So here's some deep mice to detail daily work done. We're putting together this map. So we have maps. This is all of the mass between us and last scattering. This is a reconstruction. So in this case, it's Planck. Um, this is all of the mass in the universe projected onto a scale. So I have this idea that this should be used for astrology. Because I've been ruining your life, right? <laughs> anyway, that's my retirement plan. <laughs> you can do that for me. <laughs> All right. So, again, with cosmologists, the first thing you do is you take the power spectrum. Um, so, here's the lensing power spectrum. So, this is as of maybe a month ago. Um, so this is from the recent hack release. And so what you see is this, we're not quite at the level of precision of the CMD power spectrum. We have all the really fine structure in the bumps and wiggles. Um, but you also see that there's actually not nearly as much structure in these numbers. So basically just the projected matter power spectrum, that projected matter power spectrum doesn't have a lot of features. In it. And the features that it does have, those very on acoustic oscillations, because we're looking through many, many different redshifts, those are all happening at a different angular scale for a given physical wave number, which means the acoustic oscillation is the same value. So we're really just seeing some projection of the matter power spectrum. Um, and however, you see, we actually have pretty good signal noise on this out at the high level. And down here, the Planck data is effectively sample very smooth. Say we've done almost as well as we can do down here at these uh, buildings. Not quite, it's just about. All right. So, what else do we do as cosmologists? We put constraints on things. Um, so, here's the sigma eight omega matter plane. So, I think we've heard a lot about the sigma eight omega matter plane. Right? Um, so, here is the just the results from uh, ACT and Planck. Actually, this is Planck. And what you see is that the constraints on sigma. So when people say there's an S8 tension, they're often comparing with some version that looks like this pink in here. 
Um, if you just take CMB lensing and include the baryon acoustic oscillations, you actually get some interesting constraint already. And you see there's no evidence of any problem in CMB lensing. Um, and so here's a zoom in from the recent ACT paper. And what you see here are, this is this S8 tension that Frank was talking about. Here is just the DES data. And if you just do DES, it's this really pale background over here. Sorry for the people online, pale blue is DES. And then the CMB lensing you see is this red pale stuff. And then if you include the baryon acoustic oscillations, you see it massively tightens up the CMB. It somewhat tightens up the, the um, cosmic shear measurements, but it helps the CMB a little more. So that's why CMB people really like including these. Um, but then you compare this with Planck and you see that there is no SA tension in CMB. So whatever the solution is, um, it doesn't seem as if this is something that's affecting the CMB as a probe of large scale structure. And so one reason this might be is because it's just mainly coming from higher redshift. So here's the typical redshift from which this is coming. Um, so DNDZ versus redshift. Um, so if you just say where are the bulk of the LSST galaxies or the Euclid galaxies, what you, and, and compare that to where the weight of the CMB lensing is coming from. So the CMB lensing contribution, so most of those things that are going to affect your horoscope are coming from redshift four, three or four, something like that. Um, whereas these galaxy surveys, you know, are so DS, things like that, they're not really going much past redshift of one. So um, all of the S8 tension is coming from this low redshift part. And so whatever the solution is, um, it had better not screw up the CMB too much. All right. Um, so another thing though, is that if you look at this plot right here, you see that there actually is lots of overlap. So all the bulk of the CMB lensing is coming from in behind all these galaxy surveys. Um, a lot of the lensing is in common. You know, a lot of the signal is coming from low redshift. Um, so you can do things like just say, well, is the CMB lensing coming from the same spot where we see sources? So uh, one example of, a, of sources would be the cosmic infrared background. So the cosmic infrared background actually is a little bit skewed towards higher redshift than typical galaxy surveys. So it should be something like 50 or 60% correlated with the CMB lensing. And if you make a map of the CMB lensing, so the background here is just CMB lensing convergence from SPT. And then you just overlay some contours. What you see is that, you know, there is some correlation, but you see some spots like this one in the middle here, where you see there's a massive underdensity in both CMB lensing and in the cosmic infrared background. And so what this is saying is that um, the galaxies that are building, ca causing the buildup of the cosmic infrared background um, are tracing the large scale structure of the universe. And so where there's an under density in the cosmic infrared background, you're missing galaxies, which means there's also gonna be missing structure there, which means there's gonna be less CMB lensing. And so you can see that all over the place. Um, so that's nice. It means that the, we really are mapping large scale structure in, in a way that could be useful. So this has been done many times. So here are just like, if you just, so again, you have two maps, uh, you can overlay them like this. Another thing you could do is you could take a cross power spectrum. I'm gonna say, uh, what is the CL for one map compared to the other? And so this has been done many times. So I'm just showing this, one here because they were the first people to do a whole bunch of them all at once. So Planck did this uh, and they crossed it with a bunch of different galaxy surveys. So you can cross it with clusters of galaxies. You can cross it with the Y sample. You can cross it with um, Sloan galaxies. You can cross it with those AGN that we were talking about earlier, NVSS quasars. And what you see is that that convergence map is strongly correlated with all of the number density fluctuations in these catalogs. That where you see an excess of galaxy clusters, you see an excess of CMB lensing. When you see excess radio sources, you also see a peak in the CMB lensing map on average. It's not one-to-one -one because they're not 100% correlated. Um, and so we're actually tracing the large scale structure that the galaxies are tracing, but we're doing it in a way that doesn't have quite all the messiness of having to deal with exactly how much light's coming out each unit of mass. Um, okay, so just to 
put a little math into this because that's what we all need late in the afternoon, not even that late. Um, so what do we want to do with this? So let's say that you had two maps and you want to know how correlated they are. Well, so um, angular power spectrum, something we like to do. So what do you do with an, so what is the angular power spectrum of two maps X and Y? Could be the same map, it could be, um, but if you have two maps X and Y, you want to calculate the cross power between them. So if you want to calculate the expected cross power, what you need to do is you have some map, which is an integral along the line of sight of all the structure in between. You have another map, which is an integral of all the structure along the line of sight. So if you want to actually calculate the theoretical cross power, CL, you have to do some integral along. So chi is the line of sight distance. So you see we're integrating twice in distance. These are the two maps. We're integrating all through the structure along each line of sight. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get some hit that's coming from um, the bits where the two maps are correlated. So for the modes that are correlated between the two maps, those are going to contribute to the angular power spectrum. And then since uh, we have to map a uh, you know, line of sight uh, into angle, angular stuff, we're going to end up with these Bessel functions. And you look at that, and I think any reasonable person would just say, do I really need to do this? Um, and the good news is you don't. Almost nobody here ever needs to do this. I would say that if there's more than two people that ever in your professional life will have to do this, I'd be shocked. Um, so it turns out an approximation that works really well is the limber approximation. And it only is gonna break down on large scales. And what that says is that all that you really care about is the structure that's all coming from the same redshift. You don't need to do an integral over the entire line of sight here and the entire line of sight here. But in reality, the only stuff that's gonna be contributing to fluctuations on the sky is the stuff that's at the same redshift and you're just gonna be picking out the correlated structure that happens to be next door in this part, the correlated structure that happens to be right next to each other over there. You don't need to do the whole line of sight integral multiple times and take care of the thing that's right next to us here and the thing that's halfway across the room over there, you just need the stuff that's going to be right next to each other in distance. So this it's going to just depend on the uh, how much of the structure in your map is coming from each region. So that's these rate functions. So that's how much of map x comes from each guy, how much of y comes from each guy. And then you're going to care about the 3D power spectrum for a given L at whatever L maps into the K at the redshift you want. This is the number of passage. So that's saying that if you care about an arc minute scale over the, in some direction, the structure halfway across the room is going to be coming from the things that are halfway across the room. And then you map that L into a K, and then that's the PK you pick out. And so that's the cross spectrum. So for CMB lensing, that's what I showed before. That has some structure. Uh, some It just depends on chi, which is to say the line of sight distance. For the galaxies, it's going to depend on some combination of the bias. If we're going to make this be the matter power spectrum, we care about how we map mass into the galaxy number density. That's the bias. And then we're also going to care about the number density as a function of redshift. So we get this factor of dndz flopping around. So this is something that's a little more manageable. Um, so one example of people, so this, the limber approximation is, is older than I am, far older than I am. Um, so I got these expressions from this paper by Kraluski and White. Um, it's actually a nice paper for seeing all these things if you're looking for a reference. Um, so, Let's just look at this though. So we have these weight functions and it's some integral, some B of Z. Um, well, so notice this is some B of Z times dn dz. This is just the matter power spectrum. So we can actually separate these things out. And what you end up with is an expression where if you look at the cross spectrum between the convergence and the galaxies, you get some expression that has some factor of some something that's related to the galaxy bias. So um, 
And then you do the same thing with the galaxy galaxy on their own, which is to say, if I make the map be the galaxies and the galaxies, I get the same expression, except I get galaxy bias squared, right? So the power spectrum of the galaxy density goes as bias squared. The cross spectrum with the mass though only goes as the bias. Um, so this is interesting because then we did the same thing with CMB lensing and we get some other kernel and there's no bias at all. So what this says is I can have a map, some map of the galaxies. So let's say that it's the that cosmic infrared background map. I can have my CMB lensing map. I calculate the power spectrum of my lensing map, the power spectrum of my galaxy map, and the cross power spectrum. One of them depends not at all on the details of all this messiness of the bias that Frank told us we shouldn't believe. Um, one of them depends on the bias times DNDZ squared. That's this one right here. Um, and then the other one only depends on the bias times DNDZ. So if we compare all these three things with each other, and since they're all tracing the same underlying matter power spectrum, this should give us some very uh, powerful check on whether we really do understand um, some combination of the bias and DNDZ, which is to say, do we understand how galaxies populate dark matter hal halos? And do we know what the redshift distribution is? So just to give an example of someone who did this, so this Kraluski paper, how it works. So you just take the WISE catalog and you can just break it into some, you know, different samples. So in this case, they did blue, green, and red is what they named them. And all you do is just do a cross spectrum with Planck. And you say, what do you see out of this? So this is just the galaxy number density. So this is something I was thinking of doing instead of doing a long talk was just say, well, let's just do this analysis because it doesn't take this long to do the analysis. It takes a while to do the theory interpretation, but to do the analysis super quick, just take your lensing map, you take the WISE catalog, you just bin it up, you say how many galaxies are in each pixel, and then that's what this is, how many WISE galaxies are in each pixel. So it's unwise is just a particular WISE catalog. Um, so you say how many galaxies are in each pixel, that's the number density map, and then you just do a cross spectrum between these two maps. And then what do you see? Well, you see that the auto spectrum of the galaxies is the top row, and you see those are measured really well. And this is a cautionary tale, well, not cautionary tale, but um, galaxy clustering is measured extraordinarily well. And I think for those of us that do CMB, it's shocking how well measured galaxy clustering is. The problem in galaxy clustering is in the theory interpretation, not in the measurement. Um, so these effectively are almost error-free in these two different, in these three samples. These are the auto spectra of the galaxies. Underneath is the cross spectrum between that Planck lensing map and these three different maps. And you see that these, well, they have error bars that you can see, um, the signal noise in these cross correlations is enormous. So um, CMB lensing is really giving us new handles on all of these, um, on how galaxies are populating the dark matter. Now it's only on scales that are pretty large, right? This is on degree scales. So it's not going to get us the answer of what's going on on scales of a few megaparsecs, but at least in terms of how the galaxies populate large scale structure, CMB lensing, I think, could be quite useful. All right. Um, just a second. Yeah, okay, good. I'll run four minutes over. All right. So let's go back to this plot right here. So Joel was talking about it. I showed it. Um, here are the, you know, R of 0.01, these are the B modes we want to measure. These are the lensing B modes, which is to say, let's say that you weren't only interested in reconstructing lenses. Let's say you actually cared about what happened at the very beginning of time. Um, so that's fine. That's something else you might want to do. Uh, well, this is going to get in the way. You can see that for, if you can measure this reionization bump, okay, fine. But if you're trying to measure R of 0.01 and you're using the bicep Keck experiment, you can see your error bars are kind of at the level where you're measuring these lensing B modes pretty well, but you're not really, you're gonna be, these lensing B modes are getting in the way down there. And why do I say they're getting in the way? Well, because you have to think about what it means to measure a power spectrum. So remember the power spectrum is a measure of the variance. So you go to the Wikipedia and you say, how well can you measure the variance? What's the variance on the variance? And the variance on the variance depends on how many measurements you make. So the variance on a variance 
is going to be roughly two times the number, two divided by the number of measurements. So if you make 100 measurements of something, you can measure the, so the variance of that variance will be 0.02 times whatever that variance is squared. So your error bar on your CL, so the square root of this is going to be the square root of two over n measure. And that's just saying how many modes did you measure? So if you're bicep keck, you've got your sky that you're measuring. And so that tells you how many modes you have. And then there's this CL right here, but this CL is the combination of whatever the signal is you're looking for, plus whatever else is in your map. So in this case, the CL that you would care about would be the sum of this dashed line, plus the solid line, plus however much noise is in your map. And so the way to get smaller error bars is to reduce your noise. So you either can reduce your noise and you reduce your noise until it becomes smaller than your signal or comparable. It turns out to be optimal to make it exactly equal to your signal. But you wanna reduce your noise until you're starting to see, till it's sort of comparable to your signal. And then you just need to measure more modes. Um, so in this case right here, these lensing B modes are noise. And you can't just subtract out the power spectrum of these things because you don't know what the true power spectrum is. You only know what your measured power spectrum is. So you don't know like the actual realization power spectrum of your lensing B modes from just doing this bicep keck measurement. You can't just fit to some mean spectrum and subtract it out because then you'll have to eat the sample variance on your noise. So what you need to do is you can instead make a template for your lensing B modes, which is to say, well, you measure all your E modes really well. And so what that means is you know, and you know roughly where the lensing happened. So you can actually make a guess for exactly where all the lensing happened, and you could just undo that deflection. And that goes by the name of de-lensing. So if you do de-lensing, what that does is before it even shows up in your power spectrum, you just remove the lensing from your map and it doesn't show up in here. And so this is an ongoing campaign. This is a very active thing that people are working on is different ways to do this. Um, so the current thinking is that at least with SPT and bicep CAC combined, um, what we're aiming for is to be able to get rid of, uh, you know, maybe get this down. I think we can get it down by a factor of five, reduce the power by a factor of five. So some people are less optimistic and think maybe we could only do maybe just over three, but I think we could do five. And what you see is that what that allows you to do is it allows you to push down by almost that same factor in R for noise if you're limited only by um, the signal that's out there. So um, basically this gravitational lensing reconstruction can be used to improve the search for B modes. All right, so let's stop right there for questions. Any questions? Yep. Uh, yeah, one question for the uh, uh, wise cross uh, plank lensing uh, plot. Uh, I wanted to clarify something. So um, the top uh, row is clustering and the lower row is uh, CMB lensing, right? Yeah, so the top row is the galaxy galaxy clustering between different maps, mm -hmm. which are a different, red, different redshift bins that are not entirely overlapping, but. So they've divided into three different colors, which correspond to three different redshift ranges. Mm -hmm. And then they do, uh, then you can look at the auto spectra of the three different bins. Mm -hmm. And then there's also cross spectra for those bins that are non-zero because the samples have some galaxy, some common redshift between them. I see. So, uh, uh, and then the bottom is the cross of the same maps, each one with the CMB lensing. Okay. Okay. I, am I correct to, to, to identify 1-1 one, one as the closest to us and 3-3 three, three as the highest? Okay. Yes, so 1-1 one, one is the closest sample and 3-3 three, three is the furthest sample. So, th this, so this is the kind of thing that people are going to do with LSST with things like 13 bins instead of 3. All right, do we have any other questions at the back? Yeah, so um, for most other applications of weak lensing that I'm aware of, uh, lensing B modes are seen as a source of a systematic, whereas uh, here it's obviously seen as some sort of signal. 
Um, is this related to the fact that um, CMB lensing is a second order effect? Um, no, it's actually, well, let's see, is that true? I don't think that's exactly the right way to think about it. I think, um, um, so the way to think about this is that what you could think of uh, our reconstruction as being a reconstruction of the deflection field. Um, so we can reconstruct a deflection field. And um, in the language that I used, I said we were reconstructing phi. And that was saying that we were assuming that there was some, that the deflection that we measured is the gradient of a scalar field. And that's only true if it's an E mode. So um, you can also say, well, instead of just reconstructing phi, let's reconstruct, you can think of it as phi, well, you could break it into the gradient of something and whatever is orthogonal to a gradient of something, which is a curl mode. And you can instead build an estimator for a curl mode and try to measure that. And we can do that, you can, and so this is what's weird is that we can use our B modes to construct an lensing E or lensing B. So it's like we're, we're, we're another level in here that um, the E and B that we're talking about for CMB is in the spin two polarization field, right? And so that's the equivalent of our shear measurements and the gamma one and gamma two. So in cosmic shear, you'll often talk about gamma one and gamma two, and then you could use that to then turn that into some kind of a curl or a gradient. But um, here we're kind of one level beyond that. So it's almost like if you were trying to use the tangential shear, you couldn't use the tangential shear to reconstruct B modes, I don't think, because it's tangential already. But um, but it's just, the problem is we've overloaded, we have two spin two fields here. One is related to the shear of a galaxy and the other one is related to the polarization angle, which, and they're slightly different in their origins. Maybe a good spot to take a break. It's been, uh, and we can maybe send some of those other questions to Zoom. Thank you, Gil. Thank you again.